This is our third session on Philippians 2, 12, and 13. We've already seen how the logic of therefore works in a previous session, but we have not shown how a command sandwiched between a therefore and a for works. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, and here's the command, work out your own salvation. So there's the command. Therefore, because of what went before, therefore, work out your salvation because, and then here comes another argument after it, because it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So how are we to think about the motivation for a command when it is preceded by a therefore, leading us to think about what went before, and followed by a for, leading us to think about what comes after. Father, I pray that this logical um, connection on both sides that you uh, inspired Paul to write would be plain to us and would help us to defeat sin and pursue righteousness and work out our salvation with the proper motives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, remember, this therefore goes back to, first of all, verses 9 to 11, where God has highly exalted Jesus, and the reason he highly exalted him, indicated by the therefore earlier, is because he did this. Though he was in the form of God, he didn't count equality a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. He became a servant. He humbled himself. He was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God highly exalted him. And the reason that's relevant for us is because we're, co- we're told to do the same thing. Do nothing from selfish ambition, but in humility, just as Jesus humbled himself, you humble yourself, count others more significant just the way he did when he became a servant like this to other people, even though they didn't deserve his service. He counted them more significant than himself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others, just like Jesus did here. Because since God highly exalted him, the implication is if you follow him in this, he'll highly exalt you. Therefore, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's the logic of the therefore. What about the logic of the for? For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Let me give you an an illustration that I made up. I'm going to draw it like this. Okay. This is therefore. So what's up here is supported by what's here and connected with the therefore. And this is because coming after. Here's, here's my made-up situation. You've got a 15-year-old daughter, and uh, she would love to go to her favorite performing artist. And you say, um, if you go to the concert and are dressed properly, The star, her favorite artist, will take you to dinner. Whoa. Therefore, since that's true, therefore, get dressed as you ought. Get dressed and go to the concert. Right? Because your dad has bought the tickets and will, 
will drive you and pick you and your friends, pick you up. So here's a motive that is future, right? Future, we could call it future glory. Whoa, get to be with my favorite performing artist, future glory. Therefore, get dressed and go. Think about the future and get dressed and go. Because, and this is present, what? Enablement? <laughs> Enabling? Your dad has made it possible. Your dad is working and has got the tickets. He's got the car. He's ready to take you. He's going to take you so you can count on his present participation that's going to make this future glory possible. So this command, get dressed and go, has two supports. The one support is a promise, right? If you do this, um, something amazing is going to happen. You're, you're going to be exalted. You're going to be made really happy. So bank on that promise and get about the business of getting dressed and getting to the concert. And don't fret. Like, oh, I'm 15 years old. I don't have a driver's license. How am I going to get to the concert? I don't even have a ticket. Because your dad has the tickets, has the car, has the heart. He's going to take you. And that's the present power and enabling that you have. Now, that's what we have. That's the structure we have here. Because... You will be exalted if you do, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. You humble yourself. You don't do anything from vain glory. You become a servant like Jesus became a servant. You will be exalted like Jesus. Therefore, as you have always obeyed, work out your salvation. You've got a tremendous, a tremendous promise that you can bank on. Therefore, do it. And if you say, but it's over my head. I, I can't do it. It's too hard for me. I, I can't humble myself like that. I can't become a servant like that. I can't be like Timothy and Epaphroditus and risk my life for Jesus. Do it, do it, work out your salvation because God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, is working in you. This is promise, this is power. And all I want you to see, and is it enormously important, all I want you to see is that this structure of argument, a promise made beforehand leading to a commandment, work out your salvation, and salvation hangs in the balance, work it out, followed by a promise that way before this promise comes true, when you're exalted forever and ever in heaven in eternal glory and joy, He's going to be at work in you, enabling you to will and to work for his good pleasure. So power is offered to you in the doing and promise is offered to you after the doing and therefore obey. And one of the reasons this is important to see is that it implies this power is never at work within us like magic without any conscious mental content in our head motivating us. Rather, over here, we have a conscious promise. Act a certain way and you will be rewarded a certain way. Dwell on that. Think on that. And then realize that the power at work in you is working through this promise. 
This power is not working without any reference to the promise. So this promise over here is oriented on the, on the cross of Christ. This is a blood-bought power. Blood-bought power. Because Christ died and rose again, and you are united to him, as it says in 3, eight of Philippians, because you're united to him and he died for you and bought the power of the Holy Spirit for, for you. Therefore, this power is at work within you as you think and dwell upon the promises of God. So look for this kind of structure as you read the Bible. Promises offered to you as an incentive for your working out your salvation with the assurance accompanying it that you're not left to yourself, even now in the act of obeying, you're not left to yourself because God is the one who with blood-bought power is sustaining you. There's a future dimension to this motivation and a present promise of power that he will help you. Therefore, be about obedience and you'll see this kind of obedience is utterly and gloriously unique.